um, the far side of the board is um, just to sort of outline where I'm going today, but this so, uh, will cover everything that you see on the list. All right, so um, what we're going to do finally, finally in, in module 5.3 is to get some material that actually looks like a county. So not just theory, but a lot of theory in here as well. So today we're going to look at discontinued operations and accounting changes. And that's going to be the bulk of uh, part two of your exam. I'm giving you uh, solutions to questions in the back of the text that's posted so you can practice from that. But what we need to do first is to find discontinued operations and then do some practice and demonstration of how to account for discontinued operations. So I'm going to scroll up on the screen, but I want to work on the outline on the board, and that is, what is a discontinued operation? Well, that could be a disposal of a site in a geographical area, a division, or whatever it is, you have to meet two conditions. So it has to be both a component of the entity, so there are two criteria, and they both have to be met. So it's not either or, it has to be both. And now you're getting introduced to, um, I guess, the accounting standards that you may or may not like. I mean, essentially, it's like, so sort of like business law, or a lot of it may be like uh, tax statute. So we have to meet both conditions. It has to be both a component of an entity, and it has to represent a strategic shift in the business operations. Now, strategic shift is um, a bit more like a principle than a rule, which we'll talk about in a second. So how do you define a component? Let's look at the first criteria. Criterion. The first criteria <coughs> tells you that have a component, it's got to be a portion of an entity, which is, I think, obvious. Second, it has to have its own operations, separate operations and cash flows. And it has to be clearly distinguishable from the rest of the business for operations and financial reporting purposes. So as we said, if you look at Sears shutting down stores, if you're just closing a store, one of their stores in New Jersey or in New York, it's not clearly distinguishable from any other operation. One store operates in the same way. So that would probably not be a discontinued operation. And we know that's going to be reported above the line and unusual or infrequent. So, and as we said last week, we make it difficult to get discontinued operations treatment because we don't want managers to kind of pick and choose where they want to report something. So we make it more difficult to get a discontinued operations treatment. Now, internally, a discontinued operation could be a reportable segment or any other operating sector that may not be reportable. Now, you're going to see this in advanced accounting. What's a reportable segment? Well, the purpose of going through Nike's management discussion and analysis was to show you a little bit of segment reporting. Now, that's not the only segment reporting that Nike provides as a segment footnote, but what were the business segments? It could be apparel, it could be sneakers, it could be a uh, Converse brand, whatever it is. That's a reportable segment. A reportable segment generally has to represent 10, at least 10% of sales, nothing for this course. Uh, you'll see it in advance, but it has to be at least 10% of sales, at least 10% of total assets. That's known as a reportable segment. All other segments do not have to be broken up separately, but clearly could be part of a discontinued operation. A division could be a reporting unit, a separate subsidiary, could also be a component or an asset group. So separate subsidiary, division, whatever it may be, is part of the discontinued operation. So the first criterion is that it must represent a component. To be a component, you have to have these three characteristics. And these are examples of what a component could be. It may not necessarily be, but it could be. Now, once you have that, then we have to determine whether or not there is a strategic shift so if you go to the top of the next page, you'll see what the strategic shift represents. And this is a principles-based standard. A strategic shift means there's a major impact on financial and the operating results of the company. Now, here are some examples. I did not give you the entire standard. 
but some of the examples in the standards will tell you that it could be a geographic area, it could be a separate line of business, it could be a major investment in another corporation or a major part of an entity. Now you notice the terminology, major impact, and we don't know necessarily what that means. The FASB provides us with examples of what a major component would look like. So product line, it's 15% of revenue. A geographic area that's 20% of total assets could qualify as a major shift. So what I want to point out here is something, you know, again, the, the first three weeks or more in developing the conceptual framework really will always come back to us. So if you think about what is a principle and what is a rule, a principle would say it has to be a major portion. Now that leaves it wide open, but you notice the FASB will always give you recommendations as to rules only because that's the way we built U.S. standards. We've always built U.S. standards on rules. 20%, 10%, 15%. So these are guidelines, but I think accountants will follow these guidelines only because this is the way U.S. accountants are used to operate. So major is a principle, 15% of the equivalent. So first and foremost, how do you get discontinued operations treatment? You have to have two criteria, two criteria must be met. The first criterion, you have to have a component. To have a component, it has to be a portion of the entity. It has to be an entity or a component with a separate operations and cash flow. It needs to be a clearly distinguishable core to your business, both operationally and for financial reporting purposes. Once you've identified a component, the disposal or discontinuance of that component must have a major impact on financial and operating results. What's major? Well, it could be a geographic area, a product line, whatever it is. The guidelines are examples, and there's a lot more. I mean, I've cut this down. If you go to the textbook or if you actually go to the standards, there's a lot more by way of examples as to what is a major change in the entity's financial and operating results. So any questions on that? I mean, there's not much here, but just think about the, not much here, the question, the thing, but just the judgment that gets involved. How does it get applied in practice? That's going to depend. But the main point is, it's not that easy to get discontinued operations treatment. And just remember, if you don't get discontinued operations treatment, now you've got something in unusual or infrequent items above the dividing line, and it's part of what? continuing operations. So this may sound very strange, but if you sold off a product line, and that product line might be 5% of your total revenues, it may not get discontinued operations treatment, and you're gonna see it sitting above the line continuing operations, or part of continuing operations. It becomes part of unusual and infrequent items. Okay, so any questions on that? Those are the standard, well, that is the standard. Now, if you get discontinued operations treatment, what do you report? Well, there are three components in the discontinued operations section of the income statement. And those are the income or loss from operating the segment itself, the gain or loss on measurement of assets that are held for sale as part of the discontinued operation, and let me just tell you that this is a um, different issue than just holding any asset for sale. In this case, while you're holding the asset for sale, it could be remeasured. So you could have a remeasurement of that. And you don't depreciate. So make a note that these assets are not depreciated while they're held. You're not using them so they don't get depreciated. But when you look at this note, that we hold them at net realizable value. Net realizable value is the fair value minus the disposal cost. It's the fair value less the cost to sell. So that what will happen is that the carrying value on the date of the disposal 
becomes an upper boundary. This could be the historical cost, but you could have bought the assets years ago. This could be cost minus accumulated depreciation. So you might call this carrying or book value. Book or carrying value. And what we're saying here is they're valued at net realizable value. Net realizable value is fair value, less disposable. So if NRV goes down below carrying value, you have a remeasured loss. If the NRV recovers, you could be, by the way, you might say, well, how long does it take to sell an, uh, an asset? Well, think about how long it takes someone to sell a home. If you know anyone that try to sell a house, you put it on sale, out in real estate, could be six months, could be a year. Try to sell a business. Try to sell a subsidiary. Uh, think about General Electric trying to sell a consumer products division. Could take years. Uh, and it also depends, by the way, on the government's approval of the sale. Right? So if you want to sell your business, but that, that sale could create a monopoly position, the government may delay the actual sale. So you could be holding these assets for a long time. So that's the measure it was. What happens if the NRV recovers? You cannot recognize the gain above the original carrying value. So you could have a remeasurement gain here. but only up to the original carrying value. So you could recover, but never above the original carrying value. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, um, the fair value would be, for example, you're holding, let's say, a factory. What's the NRV? What's the fair value? That's the appraisal value, minus any commissions that you have to pay real estate brokers to sell the factory. So the NRV is selling, it's pretty much fair value. I mean, we don't say that here, but fair value is pretty much the selling price. The NRV is the selling price. So just think about selling a house. You know, what are the proceeds? The net proceeds would be selling price minus sales commissions, minus any taxes you have to pay or whatever the case might be. Those would be your disposal. And then finally is the gain or loss on actual sale of the asset. And you should know how to do that for the last courses, right? Asset is sold for more than carrying value, it's a gain. Sold for less than it's carrying value, it's a loss. Just one warning on some of these problems and maybe even the exam itself. What if uh, you're holding an asset and in that first year, the NRV is higher than the carrying value, do you write it up? No. So if the fair value of the asset exceeds the carrying value, don't write it up. And I can see that happening when you're taking the test, right? You just take, put the numbers together, take the difference, and always assume it's a loss. You can't always assume it's a loss. So if the fair value or the NRV is always above the carrying value, gains can't be recognized. Okay, so those are the three components. Now, I'm going to do an example in a second. I just want to let you know two or three things here. First of all, on the gain of, on the um, operating income, the operating income, and, and you're going to find this, um, I think, a little bit strange, but everything goes back to the beginning of the year. So if I decide on December 31st to sell off this segment, I go back to January 1st. So everything goes back to the beginning of the year. And if I'm using comparative statements, I have to restate the prior years. Income statements, three-year comparative, I got to restate all three years. So when you look at the actual, let's hold it here and I'll erase it. Well, let's just say you got January 1, and you got December 31st, and you decide, you announce you're going to sell the segment somewhere here, let's say in November 1, 
you would actually resave everything as of January 1. And if you're showing financials, 2018, 2017, and 2016, you got to resave all prior years. So the discontinued operation gets, and this is, let's say, 2018, the discontinued operation gets pulled out of all the years you present for what purpose? Comparability, which is an enhancing quality back in the conceptual framework. I mean, if I dispose of the segment and only show one year, it doesn't make any sense. As I'll show you in a minute, because you're going to have this year without the segment, and these years with the segment, it doesn't make any sense. So it's going to be what you like. Now, the only way, and by the way, you show the operating income or loss for the full year, the only way it's a short year is if you happen to sell it during the year. And you have to stop the operations right when you sell the business. So if I announce the sale on November 1 and I sell it on, let's say, November 30th, if this is the sale date, then I only show income up to November 30th, not to December 31st. So it's either a full year or up to the date of the sale in those operations. Now, the next problem is going to be the remeasurement, which we already talked about. And just remember, no depreciation on that. Um, and when you hold the asset, it's carried at the lower of NRV or carrying value. It's almost like the lower of cost of money. And then finally, of course, you've got the actual gain or loss on disposal. And as I tell you here, everything's got to be shown net of tax. The entire um, discontinued off has to be shown net of tax. So everything is after tax, which I'll show you in an example in just a second. But before I do that, I just want to, you know, I've got another example in the notes, which I don't think we're going to cover. But what I want to show you is um, just very simple, I'll just put this together uh, over the weekend, just thinking about this for a second. And I said, well, maybe we need to see how the discontinued operations get pulled out of a company's income statement. So let me make this look smaller so you can see it. I think I can do that. Right, so here we go. All right. So let's assume you have an income statement that looks like this. And uh, that's the total of both the segments that you're going to dispose of and the continuing operations. You've got sales, cost of goods sold, gross profit, operating expenses, tax at 21%, income from continuing operations. And at this point, you don't have a discontinued operation. Now, you decide to sell one of the segments. And the segment you decide to sell is going to have 200 in sales. 120 in cost of goods sold, 55 in operating expenses, the tax would be 21, and the discontinued segment would be 19.7. What would happen is that I would have to strip out from the total the discontinued operation. So when I report, I'm going to show sales at 800. I'm not going to show sales at 1,000. Why? Because the discontinued operation is now eliminated from continuing operation. So remember, you've got to show discontinued separately from continuing operations. You also strip out all the line items. So you, you remove discontinued operations from cost of goods sold, from operating expenses, from taxes. And notice what happens. This is what I report. I report sales at 800, cost of goods sold at 480, Gross profit at 320, operating expenses 195, EBIT or earnings before interest in tax 125, tax at 26.25, net income 19, of oh, 98 rather, 0.75. The 1975, which is the entire segment's income statement, gets collapsed into one line. So what you're doing is you're stripping out everything from the continuing operations, consolidating, combining it, or aggregating it into one number. So everything that was in the discontinued operations, sales, cost of goods sold, operating expenses, taxes, gets combined into one number so that when you look at this income statement, you're only going to see 
and it's been covered well enough, yet we're only going to see that column. That's what's going to be reported. So when you get to see the discontinued operation, we assume there's no remeasurement and no action of sale. But this is when you look at the discontinued operations on a published financial statement, you see all of the continuing operations are on top. So those sales are just for continuing operations. Those operating expenses, just for the continuing. The discontinued ops, you take their income statement, collapse it into this one line, 19.75. And notice the net income is going to be the same, except that it's reclassified. The reason why you do that, relevance. This is no longer relevant in terms of making projections. We will have footnotes that will provide you with some of this information, because you need to know what? The materiality, another relevant quality that you need to know. So that is what happens when you have a discontinued operation. Now, questions, yeah? So you take all the, like, you take the total from the discontinued operations and then you move it into net of tax? Yeah, so and what you do is you take all the sales that relate, let's say you're selling, um, let's say we're gonna take General Electric, they just took a write-off on some disposal last night or something, big, they took a big loss. But when they sold their consumer division, which we're going to see in a footnote in a bit, let's say that's GE. You take, let's say the consumer products were 200 million. You take the 200 million out of GE's sales, you take the 120 out of their cost of goods sold, you take the 55 out of their operating expenses, and so on. Then you only report 800 in sales. But all of those other numbers still exist because the segment while you hold it is still being operated. So that income is still part of your income, although it's not going to continue. So this 19.75 is just a net, in a sense, just the net income of the discontinued segment. So what you're showing here is continuing operations and then discontinued. And they're both showing net effects. And that's what I'm saying here. So you have to show them something. And this is the first component. We didn't have a measurement, and we didn't have an actual set. So I just want you to see the visual. I have another more elaborate example in the notes where I take you know, three years comparative, but I think this is probably the best way to start, just so everyone has an idea of how the discontinued operation works. And by the way, you've got to have enough disclosure because now, and, and you have to take, if this is 2018, you've got to do the same thing, even though the discontinued operation wasn't announced, got to do the same thing for 2017 and 2016 to make them comparable. Because the numbers would not be comparable, correct? If I have the continuing operations left in at 17 and 2016, but I strip them out in 2018, the statements are not as useful. So I have to show them comparable. And I'll show you that in general electric. All right, so any other questions? That was a good one. Any other questions? Yeah, Chris. How many years do you have to go Three back? years. Income oh, statement is three years. Uh, balance sheet, um, we're going to see this more, but I, I don't think you've seen this in the intro, but just to remind you, reporting requirements dictate two years, balance sheet, three-year income statement and cash flow. So you've got two years in balance sheet, three years of income statement. Other questions? So let's do an example. And example is uh, <coughs> text. So here's an illustration where a disposal does not take place in the year the discontinued operation is announced. So it tells you that Q2 Inc. reports pre-tax income of all of its operations, that's the total, including its toy division, of 30 million. So 30 million is the total of this company's sales. On August 1st of 2020, they committed to dispose of the segment, the toy division, and its strategic shift, and it qualifies as a component. That's what you need to have the discontinued operations. 
the operating income for this segment, before tax, is $4 million. And the carrying value exceeded the fair value by 350. So what we're telling you here is that the carrying value exceeded the NRV by 350. So you got a 350 measurement loss. Tax rate's 35%, and you're asked to come up with a partial income statement. And I'll show you these computations in a second. So what happened is that the company reported 30 million in total, 4 million related to the segment that was disposed of, that means 26 is continued. So let's see what this would look like on an income statement. And here is looking at exam one, part two, type of problem, partial statement. We had a question during the uh, review on Saturday. Yeah, partial financials, not a full-blown financial. So if you take a look at this company's income statement, it is Number one, what's continuing? Well, if 30 million is the total, and 4 million represents the discontinued segment, you gotta pull that out. Now, what we're not showing you is each line item, but we're just showing you the total. So, we're pulling out the totals of 26 million relates to the continuing operations, tax of 35%, 9.1 million, so 16.9 becomes your income from Continuing operation, 16.9. I'll take some questions in a second. On uh, the discontinued operation, well, what's happening? First of all, you can show a net of tax. There was a $4 million income from the discontinued segment. The discontinued segment is subject to a 35% tax rate. Actually, what happens here, if you want to show it this way, that's not clear. Tax is 1.4, which is the 35% of the 4 million. And that would give you the 2.6 after tax operating income on the site. Now remember, what you're not seeing here are the sales and cost of console, which we didn't give you, but that's equivalent to what I showed you before. The loss is here. And there's a tax benefit. And the tax benefit means that if you have a loss and it's tax deductible, the tax savings in this case would be 122.5. Therefore, the 2275 is the after tax loss. So the discontinued operation would show 2.6, looking at these elements, 2.6 in operating income and a measurement loss of 350. Now you can't have all three, right? Because if you sell it, you want the remeasurement. But you've got the operating loss. I mean, the operating income, I should say, of 2.6, and you have the remeasurement loss of 227.5 after tax. Sometimes you might see this together, so some people may actually bring this to, uh, to a footnote, the details, but for the segment itself, it should be 2.3 So the net income itself from the segment is two million three seven two five. So let's take some questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's what uh, when we looked at the uh, format of the income statement. That's intra period tax allocation. So the tax is applied to each category of income. So continuing operations is taxed separately for financial reporting purposes. The discontinued operation is taxed separately on the operations and the measurement loss is taxed separately. <coughs> so 
When we look at this intra-period tax allocation, it means all the tax has to follow the items that give rise to it on the financials. So if continuing operations creates income, that's one tax. If discontinued operations creates income or loss, it's another tax effect. So each one is separate. And the same thing's gonna happen when we see um, prior period adjustments. And we also mention um, the comprehensive income is taxed separately. So they're all gonna be taxed separately. All right, so any questions on the first? And remember, the two first example, two components here of gain or loss in discontinued ops, operating income and remission. Now, in the next example, we're going to show you a case where you actually sell it. In the year you actually sell it, you don't have to remeasure it. Right? If you're selling it, you don't need to remeasure it. All right, so before I do that, any questions on the first example? Now, what does get tricky from time to time is if the sub or the segment has a loss. So let's see what that means. That's going to happen here. So now we continue the example and we complete the disposal. And this example tells you that we had pre tax profit from operations $3.2 million, but it includes a loss from the segment that you're going to sell, the toy division. Now, what you have to remember is if this is net of the loss, that means that the continuing operations had profit of 30 sub. So you have to add back that loss. We'll show you that in a minute. And it said that um, August 15th was the actual disposal date, and there was a gain on sale of 2 million. So let's look at the two components. You're not going to have a remeasurement in this case because you're selling. There's no remeasurement because you're selling. All right, so first, you have a $5 million loss on discontinued operations after the tax benefit is 3.25, and there's a $2 million gain, and after tax, it's 1.3 million. So let's see how this looks on the partial financial statements. <coughs> the partial financial statement, again, just to remind you uh, that the income statement is going to show you for the year ended, and this is a flow statement, so it's got to be for the year ending. Right, the first and most important point that I need to establish is, is everyone comfortable with the idea that net income reported combined is 32 million, but because the segment lost 5 million, when you pull out the loss, the continuing operations go up to 37. So we add back the loss. So that if you're operating, if you operated without the segment, you'd have 37 million in income. Segment lost 5 million, so you got 32. But now that we're separating them, the tax is on the continuing operations of 37 million. And of course, at 35%, this is going to be 35% of the 37 million. So the only thing I think that tends to trick students up with this is the loss. When there's a loss in the sub, not that hard when they're looking at it now, but during the exam, it kind of bothers people typically. If there's a loss, that loss gets added back to the continuing operations. Yeah. That was a remeasurement loss. Because that, that, that's right here. Uh, so if you look right here, this is where the carrying value exceeded the NRV by 350. So, so I gave you that number. Sometimes I might give you the carrying value and the NRV, and you have to calculate it. But right? this is problem, I gave you that number. So because of the remeasurement loss, we subtract it? Yeah, measurement loss gets subtracted. If it was a remeasurement gain, we add it. But that gain can only follow a loss. What I mean is you can't just have a gain initially. You can't write it above carrying value. It can only be written up if there was a prior loss. So gains on measurement only arise 
when there have been prior losses. Or another way to put it, remeasurement gains will reverse out prior losses. Yeah, Tom? So um, when there's a remeasurement loss, you have a tax benefit? Yes. Yeah. So just like if you have a loss on your business, you could take tax deductions. Uh, if you, uh, you know, if you have expenses in your business that cause you to have a loss, that would save taxes. So uh, losses, expenses would be tax savings. And now again, it's not a tax return, but it's just a representation of what the tax effect would be. All right. So that's continuing operations. Now. When we get to the discontinued segment, the discontinued segment reported a net loss of $5 million. So just to show you this another way, there's a $5 million loss, there's a tax benefit here. Of 35% times that $5 million, and that's going to be the seventeen fifty the taxes. One million seven fifty, and the after tax loss is thirty two. That's your after tax loss. That's the loss after the tax benefit. Go back to your question. And here. There was an action gain on the disposal. Now in this case, the tax is an expense. Of seven hundred. So it's 35%. So the gain, the gain on disposal is, is related to the loss of the income? Uh, no, the gain on this, these are all, all three components are separately measured. So it's the same segment, but you actually sold the segment. So it's like selling off a building or selling off any asset. And as I said, in this case, I'm not giving you the details, but this would be something like where you sold the division for $10 million and the, the carrying value of the division was $8 million. So you had a $2 million gain. Now, this is what resulted from operations. This is what results from the sale. And together, the, um, the two components would be 1950. So if you put this together, <coughs> you've got an after tax loss on the discontinued offer. After tax loss. <laughs> So the point is that discontinued operations have to be shown separately. When you show them separately, the three components, again, are the income or loss, which I showed you is nothing more than what? Sales, cost of goods sold combined on the sick. And then while you hold the asset, you don't, or the assets, you don't depreciate them, but they may be remeasured. And then finally, when you sell it, you've got the disposal gain. Now I'm going to show you General Electric's um, statements, but before we do that, any other questions? Okay, so these are examples, I'm not saying they're exactly the same questions, but we do, you know, we do a lot more uh, when we review. We have all those problems in the back that I recommended, plus uh, I've got a couple of other self-assessments that I can have you look at. Well, before we do that, any other questions before we move ahead? You have to be able to break out the discontinued segment from the continuing operations. All right, so let's take a look at General Electric. Here's another, there's another example here that you can look at. Uh, here's GE from 20, 
15. And the discontinued segment could have been decided or announced in 2015. Even though it was announced in 2015, all prior years have to be restated. So it means that when you look at the sales, let me just put the number up here. The revenue, let's just take 2015. <coughs> that revenue excludes the discontinued operation. That excludes the discontinued operation, and that's the same thing for every line item. So every line item has been reduced. Every single line item has been reduced for the discontinued operation. So that all you see on the bottom here <coughs> is going to be the continuing operations and the tax, and then bottom line income. Then, that's continuing operations. Continuing operations before tax, tax provision on the continuing operations, and then the net income from continued. The discontinued operations, as you can see, are broken out separately. What this represents is the income, net income, or net loss, as you see in 2015, of the discontinued operations. So if you look at the 2015, 2014, and 2013, there was a loss of 74.95, 585. And five four seven five. This is the discontinued operation portion of the income statement. What that represents. So the seventy four ninety five is the revenues and all the expenses collapsed into this one line. All these lines above have been reduced for that for those amounts. I know you don't see them. But this is an actual example that I want to make sure that So continuing and discontinued have to be reported. So then if we go to the footnote, by the way, notice earnings per share. Earnings per share is on continuing operations and on net income, as I said. Sometimes uh, you'll have discontinued in there as well. But to answer a question we had earlier, income tax is on each one separately. So you have tax on continuing, and you have tax on the discontinued. Now, when you go to the footnote, this, this is the most important part of this illustration. And that is that this is the discontinued operations related to the consumer products, the appliance businesses, the real estate business, and a mortgage business. So they, they um, discontinue lots of its operations. But notice what happens here is they do give you some information on how the loss and profit from the discontinued operation was computed. Right? So if you go to the income statement, you see that should be income. When you go to the income statement, you see a loss of $74.95 in 2015. You see profit of $58.55 in 2014. 5475 and 2013, this is what makes up those gains and losses. Now, you don't get a lot of detail. Some companies give you more information with respect to the discontinued operation. GE only gives you a summary. But the point is, it does help you in some way. So, for example, if you wanted to, if you took those revenues of 23003, and this is the revenue GE reports in 2015. This means that they would have had $140,389,389. So 
if you use the footnote, revenues with the discontinued operation would have been 14389 When you pull the discontinued operation out, it's 17386 Now, here's where the thought process begins. Why are we giving you that information? What, what is someone going to do with that? Why do we need to know what the sales from the discontinued operation would have been? Or what sales would have been had I not sold the segment? Why would you need that? What are some of the qualities that make information relevant? The change of, per the change of percentage for uh, revenue. The percentage of revenue, yeah, exactly. Is it material? How material is this segment? You're gonna find out it's about 16%, right? So this segment is about 16 and a half percent, roughly, of total revenue. So it's material. So materiality is a part of relevance. It makes the information relevant. Um, it has no predictive value, by the way. Zero predictive value. Why? You're not going to have the segment anymore. Why would I build that into my forecast? Right? So it has no predictive value. It might have some confirmatory value, maybe, if you were forecasting from prior years. Because don't forget, all the prior years now, 2012 and 2011, are not really comparable. <coughs> So if I'm doing a forecast, I'm going to have to start with 2013. I can't go back any further. But this does help. And, and it does give you some, some comparability. So that's the reason why we provide that information. So the information is there primarily for judging materiality of the segment and perhaps helping you with some comparability with the prior accounts. So that's GE's discontinued operation. That was its consumer product business. So they picked that one because I know it was going to be significant. Um, so it has uh, relevance and comparabilities and enhancing quality that um, would also come in to this example. All right, so any questions at all? And, and I'm just saying that this is one type of disclosure. Some companies give you a full-blown income statement. You get to see everything. You get to see sales, cost of goods sold, Any other questions? All right. Now, uh, remember, if it doesn't qualify for discontinued operations, it's part of unusual or infrequent items. So uh, for whatever reason, if this did not qualify for discontinued <coughs> operations, it would be part of continuing operations. You wouldn't see it net of tax, and you would not see it on the EPS. All right, so that's really it for discontinued operations on the US GAAP. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, IFRS, and then we'll move to uh, accounting changes. But before we do that, any other questions on this situation? Yeah. If you were doing 2016, would you report those numbers for 2015, 2014? Yeah, but so 2016, 2016, you would get uh, 2015 and 2014. So, so 2016, you said nothing there, right? Well, it depends. If they, um, if they didn't sell it yet, you'd still have it. Yeah. If it was sold in 2015. Yeah, then you wouldn't have it. Yeah. So that's a real good question, because for comparability, what would happen if I went back to Genie's income statement, I would have to show continuing and discontinuing in 2016 if I still held on to some of those segments. Actually, they sell, you know, if, if you look carefully, they, they did sell off a lot of them. Because you can see that, um, well, you'll see it more in the, in the asset side, but they did make some disposals. Um, I think it's in there. They mentioned in the footnote somewhere, but they did sell off some of them or uh, finalize some of the sales. Any other questions? Would you ever use that information to bring segment back? To go back? Um, yeah, like let's say you put something in the segment, but then later on would you use that information to bring it back? Yeah, I mean, looking, that's what I said, I think in a way before, that you know this information is good to, uh, for instance, let's say I announced the discontinued operation here in 2015. Last year, when I reported 14, 13, and 12, 
the segment was included. So this may be a way to help me compare the prior years, but going forward, I got no predictive, uh, has zero predictive value. And I don't think you're going to really go back, you know, and, and use this if you're going to sell off that division. What happens also, it's um, it's interesting because if you announce you're going to sell off the segment, let's say they announced in 2013. You put less resources into that division. So if GE announces they're going to sell off the consumer products division, they, they, they stop investing in that division, right? Um, they will probably transfer their best management out of that division. So it's obviously not managed as well. And you probably do affect the results of it also. So, you know, again, that's why we break it out separately, because now it's 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 clearly distinguishable and it's broken out separately, it's no longer managed in the same way. Good questions. All right, anything else? All right, IFRS. IFRS is very similar with one exception. Um, their discontinued operations are defined much more simplistically it's either going to be a separate line of business or a geographic area or a subsidiary that you bought with the purpose to resell it. Now, why would you do that? Well, it could be part of a deal. So, for instance, if you uh, want to sell, let's say you've got a, a hardware division, a uh, computer hardware division, but you need to enhance that with software, you may buy a software company, combine them, and then sell them together. You get more money on the sale by having that division in hand. So that's what they're looking at here. The other and the most important component of this is that it must be part of a plan to dispose of the segment. So this term has to be a part of a single coordinated plan of disposal. So if you're looking at a question, if the question is not saying, I'm not going to go through this example because it, it pretty much tells you that they're going to sell the division, but it doesn't tell you anything about a single coordinated plan, it must have that plan at disposal. If the plan does not exist, then it would not be a discontinued operation. Uh, their reporting is the same. It has the three components, the operating income or loss, the remeasurement gain or loss, and the gain of loss on disposal. But to really get this for you in some, I think, way to have you make the uh, proper comparison is if you take a look at uh, this comparative chart, just a couple of key items. I mean, once a discontinued operation is the same, it's, it's really a component that you're going to sell or you're holding for sale. The definition, US GAAP has the three conditions. Comparing that here, it just has to be a major line of geographic area or a sub that you purchased with the purpose to resell. Here's where we get into some differences. This is important not only for exams here, but also CPA purposes. Um, strategic shift. A strategic shift is required under US GAAP, no, no such requirement under IFRS. Part of a single coordinated plan has to be existing on the IFRS, but not on the US GAAP. So you just have to sort sort those out. Um, so the, the, the real key is the uh, coordinated plan for IFRS and the strategic shift for US GAAP. The component is pretty much the same. And the reporting requirements are the same as well, uh, except for the balance sheet. So that you know, we report revenues and expenses, but the IFRS does not really give you any information on balance sheet numbers in the footnotes. But look what happens on the US GAAP. You don't have to memorize this, I'm going to show you in a second. On the US GAAP, the balance sheet effect, let's take a look at GE, is going to do the following. So let me bring this up here a little bit larger. Alright, 
So let's go into, and remember, what Chrissy asked the question before, balance sheet is two years. All right, so all of these assets have been stripped of the discontinued operation. All of the assets have been reduced by the discontinued operation, and we hold them separately here as a separate line item, assets of the discontinued operation. So this is the total of all of the assets that were removed from each individual line item. The, uh, again, you know, Pedro asked, answered the question before, if you look at the, um, if you add this back, it would be about $500 billion of assets. This is one-fifth of 25%. It's a pretty big segment, right? So if you look at, if you add these together, you know, so the, the segment itself is about one-fifth of the total assets at 25%. That's a material component of the business. We also do the same thing with liabilities. So all these liabilities have been reduced, and the obligations are here as the liability and highlighted the liabilities of the discontinued segment. So you will find out if you go to the balance sheet, you break out the assets and liabilities separately. And what I, th I thought was pretty interesting here is that you get almost a full balance sheet here. So this is in the footnotes, these are the assets and liabilities that are held on the discontinued segment. Those are the assets and the liabilities that are held on the discontinued segment. That's the 12951 you saw on the balance sheet. So for example, if you look at cash, cash is about $20 billion. That, um, you know, when you look at the uh, balance sheet here, it means that if you go back to GE, their cash on their balance sheet was 20, or 70 billion. The discontinued op was 20 billion. That means that if you put the discontinued operation back, it's about $90 billion in cash. So the 20 billion was taken out of here and moved down to the discontinued operations. Again, materiality. Again, you know, Juan was talking about that before. Maybe some comparability with prior years, no predictive value. So it does help you with materiality. It does help you a bit with comparability, but it has zero predictive value. All right, so that is the discontinued operations. Now, what I will do is I'm going to give you a, uh, a self-assessment question. I'll probably put it up on the blackboard. Maybe we can do that during the review. You also have tons of questions. Um, I gave you at least, I think, eight on the back of Chapter 5 to look at. Uh, good review questions for, for this purpose. And then on Sunday, if we have any questions on that, I'd be more than happy to go over that. But for exam purposes, this is one of the questions in part two, uh, very similar to the two examples we did here. Not exactly the same, but uh, very similar to those questions. All right, so I don't know if we have any questions now before we go on. I'm actually going to, I am going to move to, uh, I'm going to come back to the questions in the back of the module. But I want to just start uh, introducing the counting changes. But before I do that, let's be sure anything else on discontinued operations. Again, for multiple choice purposes, for theory, you've got to know the criterion, the characteristics, IFRS versus US GAAP for this purpose. OK, so let's then take a look at Five, and we'll get back to those questions or at least I'll get the answers to you. Want to introduce accounting change. And this is the second. I want to make sure you have exposure to these two problems as soon as possible. So this will be the second type of question in part two of the exam. And that's going to be to cover accounting changes. Now, in accounting changes, we can either have a change in estimate, change in principle, the book also talks about change in the reporting entity, which you'll see in mergers and acquisitions. What's the change in the reporting entity? Walgreens buys the main read. Now, all of a sudden, Walgreens, before the merger, doesn't look the same as it did after the merger. So that's an accounting change. We're not going to cover that. Another type of accounting change, which we'll pick up just very briefly on Thursday, is corrections of errors. If you find an error in your financial statements five years 
Later, you don't change your income statement. It's a separate type of accounting, or a special type of accounting, which we'll see. So the way to look at changes in principle and changes in estimate. Now, we know that accounting changes, and we're not, we already did this, could be triggered by income reporting strategy. The only thing I want to add here is that voluntary changes are what we really worry about when we look at income reporting strategy. But when a FASB is issued, when a new FASB standard is issued, the FASB will tell you, we passed the regulation today. So the new FASB standard is passed today, but you don't have to apply it until 2021. What if a company adopts it early? What would be their incentive? Why would you early adopt the standard? Could be for earnings management, right? Could be a standard that improves your operating results. It could be a standard that increases your net income. So you'll adopt it early. If it doesn't, you may not. So the early adoption of mandatory changes is also included in the reporting strategy. Now, when you make these changes, the most important thing to know is that all accounting changes violate comparability, they violate consistency. So every accounting change that's made will violate consistency and will violate the comparability and the enhancing quality. Do we prohibit changes? No. Accounting changes are permitted as long as adequate disclosure is made to restore the comparability with prior years. Now, there's two ways we can implement accounting changes. The first way is, and as we said, the two types we're going to worry about are changes in estimate and changes in principle. But the two ways we can do that is retrospective or prospective. So what's a change in estimate? Change in estimate is a change in useful life of a plant asset. A change in estimate is a change in estimating bad debts. Change in estimate is a change in your estimated warranty costs that you expect to pay. What's a change in principle? Change in inventory accounting method. Changing from FIFO to, to weighted average. That's a change in principle or method. Now, how do you count for them? Retrospective versus prospective. What's a retroactive or retrospective change? This means that all prior years are restated. So when you have a retrospective change, all prior years are restated as if the new standard was always used. So when you have a retrospective change, all prior years are restated as if the new method was always used. Now the only thing is if you go back more than uh, on the income statement, you go back more than three years, balance sheet go back more than two years, the effects of that change could have been piling up for years. You also have an effect on the balance sheet. So let's say you have to write inventory up. If you have to write inventory up, you also have to balance that where? Probably retain earnings. It's called a cumulative effect. So what's going to happen is that if I make a change, on my, eventually on my balance sheet, for the first balance sheet presented, let's say I change methods. Let's say I change to the FIFO method. FIFO tends to overstate inventory. So if my adjustment increases inventory, the balance, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for the cumulative effect because there's some tax effects here as well. But in retained earnings, the cumulative effect of the change has to be reported as well. And this is the cumulative effect of retrospective. So this is the effect of all prior years. Well, the first, this is actually in the first balance sheet.
So in a retrospective type of change, all prior years are restated with the first year having that cumulative effect in materials. Because if you have to adjust your inventory, you gotta balance it out someplace, and it goes into the table. In a prospective change, you just make the change in the year of the change and all future periods. In a prospective change, prior periods are not adjusted. Prior periods are not adjusted. So in a prospective change, prior periods are not adjusted. All prior years are treated as final. And that's because changes in estimate are not considered all that significant as we'll see. So what are the standards? We've got two primary types of changes and we've got two different methods. Well, what happens is that when we look at the change in estimate, Changes in estimate are accounted for on a prospective adjustment basis. Changes in principle are more significant. retrospectively applied. Let me bring it up on the screen. Exception. change is impractical. If the change is impractical, then it's done on a prospective basis. What is a change impractical? Well, think about this for a minute. And by the way, all changes are effective as of the beginning of the year. So uh, that may sound strange again. So here I am, you know, on uh, October 2nd, and I'm looking at my results, and maybe I'll make an accounting change. And it could be just as easy as that to make that accounting change, and it goes back to January 1st. It does not take effect as of October 2nd. It takes effect as of January 1st. So all accounting changes are effective as of the beginning of the year. Now, how is a change in principle impractical? And when it's impractical, it's got to be prospective only. Well, I mean, I think this is going to make a lot of sense if any one of these three any one of the work, and here we're back again to accounting standards, you know, the rules that we have to follow in the codification. If any one of these three exists, a change in principle is impractical, you cannot apply it retrospectively, you have to apply it on a prospective basis. And that would be if the effects are not determined. You don't have enough information to find out what the new method, remember, when you retrospectively apply, you've got to go back to all prior years as if you always use that new method. So you may not have enough information. You may need information about assumptions that management made with respect to intentions that existed in those prior years. You don't have that information. Or you may need estimates that were made in the prior period and the information needed to determine those estimates is just not available. So if any one of those three exists, a change in method cannot be applied retrospectively, it's applied prospectively. Now, this would apply to LIFO, and I can't give you too many examples at this point in your uh, curriculum, but LIFO means that if you want to switch to LIFO, you would have to get all the prices that would have existed in your inventory from how many years back that would have been old costs that you'd have to dig up somehow. And that may not be practical. So a switch to LIFO is an example 
of an impractical change. An impractical